All right, good evening, everyone. We begin the readout tonight with a critical question that took over politics Twitter this weekend, thanks to a Washington Post essay by Robert Kagan. That question being, what's to be done about our constitutional crisis? Kagan writes that the Republican Party today is a zombie party. The party's main, if not sole purpose, is as the willing enabler of Trump's efforts to game the electoral system to ensure his return to power. These enablers from the MAGA monsters who smashed the once sacred space of our U.S. Capitol to those in office like Arizona Congressman slash insurrectionist Paul Gosar, they consist of a real and very dangerous faction of the Republican Party today. Congressman Gosar is saying he wants a Trump-Biden rematch by year's end, while describing the Arizona frauded as, quote, a good start. Kind of saying the quiet part out loud, because that is exactly what this gaslighting, anti-democratic exercise has always been about. A start to solidifying the norm of challenging, but really stealing, future elections. That Cyber Ninja report, which may or may not have been written in orange Cheeto font, found that Biden defeated Trump by more votes than the original count. And yet, that very finding now has Trump Republicans doubling down on their election lies. With Arizona GOP chair and big lie minion Kelly Ward calling for a new audit because Arizona tax dollars haven't been wasted enough. What this bogus report said never really mattered so long as the performance of speculation aired on Trump media, so long as it kept the big lie alive. And it is very much alive. Similar sham partisan recounts are now happening in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Texas. Your vote questioned, your decision threatened, while changing election laws to make it harder for Democrats to win and easier for them to challenge the results each time they lose. That does not describe a democracy. It is, instead, the very calculated plan already in motion to overturn the 2024 election and restore Trump, or some version of him, back in power. With me now is Stuart Stevens, senior advisor for the Lincoln Project, and Ellie Mastal, justice correspondent for The Nation. And Stuart, I want to start with you, um, because you spent a long time working in, you know, normal era Republican politics. And I, I just wonder what you made of the Kagan argument that essentially, you know, what we saw was not just a ragtag band of losers ransack the Capitol and defecate all over the place. What we saw was a practice uh, round for overturning future elections that actually continued and has been extended with these fake recounts and changing election laws. Do you agree with that basic premise? A hundred percent. I read Robert Kagan's article and I said, hallelujah, I'm going to go out and pass it around like watchtowers door to door. Um, there is a need for us, uh, a lot of us, to believe that we live in a normal time. We have a normal president. There was such great tension over the last um, four years of Trump. But that would be a huge mistake. And it is exactly what the autocrats who have become the Republican Party want us to do. They, they, they are very patient. They're very well funded. They have these buffoonish characters out front, but they're not buffoonish. And what Robert Kagan said is so dead on, and we have to take this seriously. It is a threat to democracy. And the Republican Party, I, it's mind boggling to say this for somebody who worked in the party, but there's no alternative. But the truth is an anti-democratic, autocratic force. It is not a normal party in the sense that it has a different ideology than the Democratic Party. It exists to change democracy in America and ultimately in an unrecognizable form. You know, and Ellie, not to have you engage in media criticism here, but I think one of the challenges that that I feel, I'll take it upon myself, is that this conversation is not the way most of, you know, the media, most of political press really, con you know, sort of conducts itself in approaching the Republican Party. There is a tendency to sort of veer back toward normalcy and try to make both the parties fit into sort of an on the one hand, on the other hand, they're having a normal political debate. This is just about political debate. That's a normal way of dealing with things. And I think there is a sort of compulsion to try to drag the Republicans, Democrats back to that norm. But I, I, you know, some of us who are out here saying, no, this is this is fascism. This was the beer market push that we saw on January 6th. This was a rehearsal for an undemocratic society. You sort of sound like crazy, right, if you're trying to say that. And I wonder if you think that maybe this sort of this sort of de the, the, the desire for norms, even in the Justice Department, and you've said that criticism a lot, is what's preventing us from fighting this the way we should. 
I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the mainstream media loves the two-party system. It gives them conflict. It gives them drama. And admitting that one of the parties is not a political party, but a white supremacist rump who has who has risen to try to overturn democracy doesn't fit neatly in their narratives. And so they try to deny it and they try to, as you put it so well, try to bring us back to normal. So what's happening is pretty clear here. First of all, Trump has now lost the 2020 election more times than New York Jets, right? Like he, he, he's, he's got nothing, they're, they're, that's done with, right? But this, as you pointed out, was never an effort really to, to relitigate the 2020 election. It's always been about 2022 and 2024. For. The Republicans have no other strategy to win. And, you know, Stuart well knows if you go back to 2012, when, you know, the Republicans were picking, when Mitt Romney got his teeth smacked in by Barack Obama, the Republicans were picking up the pieces. They had an autopsy and they saw that the only way forward for their party was to expand their base beyond the white supremacist rump that usually votes for them. That was the only solution except for authoritarianism. If we have a country where everybody who wants to vote can vote and all of those votes are counted, the Republicans are not a viable national party. And instead of like dealing with that, you know, sadness and 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 responding to that, they have gone in this other direction, which is the hard right fascism that we see all across the country right now. You know, and so you're from Mississippi, so you, you, you've seen that kind of politics up close, right? There is a way, I mean, that is the state with the largest population of African Americans in the entire country. Yet Democrats cannot win anything there because the state is, is sort of gerrymanured and there is a manufactured minority rule that feels almost permanent, almost no matter what Democrats do in that state. It's fixed for the Republicans. It does feel like they're trying to expand the same Mississippi strategy. You can see them doing it in Texas. You can see them doing it in Florida. Uh, you know, and, and so it works there even in a state that's diverse. But let's go to a state that's not diverse, uh, Wyoming, <laughs> by my old state of Colorado. Here's Liz Cheney of Wyoming uh, talking about the leader of her, of her party. Take a listen. What he's done is embrace Donald Trump. And if I were doing what he's doing, I, I would be deeply ashamed of myself. I don't know how you explain that to your children. There's a difference between somebody who voted for Donald Trump and being the Republican leader after an insurrection and setting all of that aside and going to Mar-a-Lago and, and rehabilitating him, bringing him back in. That, to me, is unforgivable. So here's the problem that I have, Stuart. She voted for Donald Trump, right? So it, she's voted for Donald Trump's agenda almost universally. So, but she's saying there's a difference between that and what Kevin McCarthy is doing, which is basically sitting at Trump's feet and asking him to be petted, right? Asking to be petted. Um, but she also says that behind the scenes, other Republicans are glad that she's out front fighting Trump. They don't have the courage to do it themselves. They'd rather this lady, they'd rather hide behind her skirts and let her do it. Meanwhile, the person Trump wants to run against her, who used to call Donald Trump a racist, her name is Harriet Hegeman. She's a Wyoming Republican. Um, Trump wants her to run. But five years ago, she tried to overturn his victory in the primary race. She called him a bigoted candidate who would repel voters. She said that um, it would make it hard for Democrats to win a national election. She used to be just like Elise Stefanik. So you have this situation where the Republicans who are weak just roll over and the Republicans who are strong in theory, like Liz Cheney, vote for him and will vote for him again, I'm sure, if he runs in 2024. So I don't know how you well, stop it if even the Liz Cheney stick with him. Well, I don't think Liz Cheney is going to vote for Donald Trump again. And she voted for impeachment and she's voted for the one six commission. You may not agree with her political view, but she has a political view you can disagree with. It still is an yeah. ideological fight. She is defending democracy here. We would be a lot better off if we had impeached Donald Trump. If Republicans uh, at that moment after the insurrection, when they could have impeached Donald Trump, they would have prohibited him from taking office again. And it could have begun at least a process of rehabilitation of some sort of affirmation of democracy. They didn't do that. And I've said this before, I think it's gonna go down like the Munich Accord is one of these tragic moments of attempting to appease somebody. But at least, you know, Chamberlain was a well-intentioned person. Um, <laughs> you know, the trouble I have with people that switch in the way uh, this uh, woman from Wyoming has, I, I just don't believe people change deeply held beliefs in a few years. I think it yeah. just proves that you didn't deeply hold those beliefs. It's hard because you think about Brian Kemp, you think about Brian Kemp, you know, Ellie, this guy's done everything but roll over and show Trump his belly. And Trump still hates him. 
Trump still hates him because no matter what he tries to do to appease Trump, you know, somebody with that kind of sociopathology will never love you. They will never appreciate it. They will never be grateful. He still is like, well, I'd rather have Stacey Abrams than you, Brian Kemp. He's still rejected. He still mocked him this weekend. I, it, it's almost as if, I mean, there's nothing that Republicans can do to appease Trump enough. Kevin McCarthy, there's nothing he can do to appease Trump enough other than hand him back the White House. That's it. That's all you yeah, can do. Look at the former VP. Go ahead. The willingness for Republicans to be debased for this man is is one of the stories of our time, right? Like, you know, you can look at Ted Cruz letting that man yeah. talk talk bad about his wife and just didn't didn't do nothing. You can look at the uh, the younger Bush, let him talk bad about his dad, just didn't wouldn't do nothing. Like just the just the level of I, I think the word is cowardice um, and debasement that these people are willing to go through in service of Donald Trump is is frankly shocking. But again, there th there's more here than just like the the personal moral failings of the Republicans. They have a plan here, and that plan includes getting secretaries of state in place in various um, critical states who are willing to throw away duly cast votes. I mean, like, there, so there, there are two things going on. There's like the very public clownishness, right, where Republicans kind of beclown themselves to Donald Trump. But then there's the very serious attempts to not just overthrow democracy, but to make it so that democracy cannot happen again. Um, in 2022 and 2024. And those those tracks are going in parallel. Both of those things are happening at the same time. Yes, the gullible people might think that, you know, next week they're going to have a rematch and that, you know, a fool and his money are easily parted and the Republicans are happy to take their money. But what they're actually doing is far more scary. And it's directly, you know, it's pointed head on at taking away the rights of people to have their votes counted in the future.